meeting is being recorded. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, just please stand by until we get everybody in the classroom. Before we get started, my name is Jerry, and I will be facilitating tonight today's program. Uh, thank you very much for attending. So, stand by. Everyone will stand by for a little bit until we get started. So, thank you very much for attending today's program. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting the program shortly. Thank you very much for attending today. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We're almost up to 40 people. There were about 50, uh, 50, over 50 people that signed up for the seminar today. Uh, we will get started shortly. We will get started shortly. Thank you very much for attending. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting shortly, so stand by. I have a computer on the right, and there's a few people sending me some emails attempting to log on, and I sent them uh, that information. So, John Jablonski, would you like to unmute yourself and be prepared to uh, <laughs> make a statement, please? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not good at public speaking, so I apologize. Um, no, um, yeah, yes, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry and, and the folks at the Institute for your leadership. Um, this is a program uh, sponsored uh, by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Commissioners, uh, along with, with Jerry and, and the Fire Services Institute. Um, and uh, I, I'm very honored to 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 indicate that um, back at, when I was 16 years old, I joined my volunteer fire company. Uh, we had six fire companies uh, in Hanover Township, a first class township. I'm not sure if Chief Tim Rance is on. Um, there was a waiting list. Um, each 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 company out of the six had 35 on the on the roster and a waiting list. Um, we all know that times have changed. Um, as, as a township commissioner myself, and I see a lot of my my, my fellow township commissioners here. Um, we feel that, that the time has come really to, to begin this working partnership between um, fire service uh, folks, uh, elected officials, township managers, um, and really discuss you know, where, where we're going collectively as a future. Um, I don't think there is an answer. I think there's a multitude of answers. Um, and really depending on the unique situations that your townships and your regions, regions face. We're very fortunate that we have folks from around the Commonwealth here, um, first class townships of all different sizes. Um, but, but, you know, our goal here today um, is to begin the beginning of, of, of a long term journey. This, this problem isn't going to be solved by four o'clock today. Um, but, but yeah, what are best practices? Um, how are folks doing it around the Commonwealth and around the country? Um, you know, what could we do to, to, to help, uh, you know, institute dialogues between, uh, uh, um, you know, different methods, whether it be regionalization, whether it be a combination department and all those things that we're going to talk about. But what I encourage you to do is please share your thoughts, um, um, you know, what's working, what's not working, um, what you'd like to see, um, um, you know, some of your thoughts of where we're going. Um, we're all here because we're passionate about our communities. We're all here because we want to do what we feel is in, in the best interest of the future of our communities. Uh, regardless of the hat or hats that you wear, um, you, you, you have a passion for public service. And it's incumbent upon us to really deliver that, that public service, in this case, fire services, in the most effective way possible, not looking at yesterday, but really planning for tomorrow. And, and as we all know in the fire service, prior proper planning uh, prevents poor performance. Well, we need to take that to heart and how do we plan for our futures collectively? Um, you know, a lot of volunteer firefighters and, and, and career firefighters 
Um, they're very good at fighting a fire, but sometimes fire administration is where things start to break down um, as we move forward. So thanks very much, Jerry, for your leadership. Um, with that, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, but 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 yeah, please don't hesitate to to reach out to me. Um, um, you know, over the coming year, and uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to to work as president of the state association in uh, 23, 24 calendar year. Um, we're going to drive programs like this um, on a continual basis. Uh, you know, to begin dialogues, to begin discussions, to share best practices both in person and uh, uh, virtually. So, thank you very much for your time. And uh, Jerry, I hope that wasn't too long. And no, that was just perfect. And uh, again, thank everyone for attending. What our goal today is, is going to be to share some, some, uh, some feedback and discussion about uh, the fire service in Pennsylvania and specifically uh, uh, the relationship uh, and what is happening in first class townships and how things are, are coming together. Uh, it is a unique time in Pennsylvania and uh, we, we know the challenges. Uh, I have been uh, involved in emergency services in Pennsylvania for over 30 years and four different areas in Pennsylvania, from rural areas to suburban areas. And uh, I've served in a variety of roles uh, in, in paid EMS organizations and nonprofit organizations, uh, colleges. And uh, I've been a volunteer fire chief in a suburban community in, uh, outside of Harrisburg for probably 12 years. And then I was out for a little bit and now I'm, I'm back in. Um, and, and we're gonna, tap into the expertise that all of you have in this room to determine and, and identify some best practices where we can move forward together in, in what is happening. And that's why I did send out that survey, okay? And I'm gonna review some of the results of that survey, but I'm gonna also introduce and, and let uh, another subject matter expert uh, um, who is, I asked to be part of this, uh, uh, is Chief Jared Renshaw from, from Western Berks, and he could explain his background a, a little bit and how, how, how uh, Jared and I have worked together in the past. So, mm -hmm. Yes, hi. Thank you, uh, Jerry, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, you know, the inner workings of fire department relationships with their, uh, you know, municipal officials and their local government is something that I'm extremely uh, passionate about. That I've become very passionate about throughout my career. So I, you know, started as a uh, as most people do as a junior volunteer firefighter in the suburbs of Pittsburgh and uh, have since, you know, morphed my passion and my, my volunteering into my career working as a career firefighter in South Carolina, career battalion chief in California. And uh, since 2015, I've been working here at the Western Berks Fire Department as the fire commissioner um, since 2015. So we are a, a regional combination department. So we're made up of career and volunteer firefighters. Um, the great thing about us is that our first due coverage area and what, what our responsibility is actually encompasses four separate municipalities. So we have two boroughs and two townships of the second class. Um, you know that you know some of the governing there with you know second class townships is, is a little bit different than first class townships. But you know, I basically have 20 different elected officials between my council members and, and my township supervisors that I report to on a daily basis besides my board of directors. So um, you know, this is something that, you know, I've, I've worked on to build those relationships and to, you know, bring my department to where it is today, uh, you know, through a lot of hard work of my people and, you know, recognizing that we weren't going to get anywhere if we weren't able to work with our municipalities and to be able to provide the level of service that we do. So um, I really appreciate uh, Jerry for inviting me to be on here and, and I'll definitely, um, you know, be chiming in and um, you know, if anybody wants contact information for me on, you know, how my department operates or how we're, we operate, how we work, how we're designed, uh, please feel free to reach out to me because we are a very unique beast. So I'll hand it back over to Jerry. Great. Thank you very much, Jared. And I'd uh, like, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody has, uh, you know, just to confirm the screen is up, correct, Jared? Yes, it is. The screen is up. Yes. Very good. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. So. Basically, uh, again, here's our introductions. Uh, the agenda today is uh, what we're gonna talk about uh, over, over the period of time. And again, there will be chances for you to have input. If we were standing in a room or our normal seminars that, 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 that we do, uh, the first part of the seminars are you know, seeking information. And that's why I sent that survey out. We're gonna review pieces of that survey. Okay, we're going to review pieces of that survey, and we're going to talk about that. 
And we're going to talk about that survey and we're going to identify, you know, some hey, of the feedback that you gave to me. Hey, Jerry, okay. real quick. Yes. Jerry, real yes. quick. On my screen, it's only showing half of yours. I don't know if anybody else has that on theirs. Yeah. It's showing sure. your entire screen. How's that right there? Hey. Uh, no. It's still only half. Okay. Yep. Hold on one second. There you go. There we go. There we go. How are we there? How are we there? Um, perfect. That's oh, perfect. Excellent, guys. Thank you very much for doing that. And that's how we're going to plan on running it. We're then going to move into the next section of it after this, after I show you some of the survey results to the governing practices, governance and, and best practices of, of what's happening. What are we seeing in Pennsylvania today and how that, that how are fire departments governed? Okay. How, what is their relationship with municipalities and, and how has that changed? And the last part of this uh, today is we're going to talk about the evaluation of performance and how do you know, how do you know your organization is performing? Because in general, you hear the comment on a regular basis, uh, we don't have enough volunteers. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have some issues during the daylight or on the weekends, none of our volunteers are around. And, and, and those are probably true statements, but until you have a good performance measurement system in your organization and through your township, and that is based on what's called a standard of cover and kind of identifying what you want for a standard or what your citizens should want, and then measure that because we see organizations around Pennsylvania making decisions based on no data or very little data or not understanding. And when we're moving, you know, how many volunteers do we need? Well, some people decide, oh, we need to hire some uh, drivers during the daylight. Well, is that the right thing to do? Or somebody says, let's do a part-time or a paid on call. But, but you cannot move forward with that until you clearly identify data that, that shows where, where you're going, what does it look like, okay? And then you have to look at it as a full package, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Hey, we have Jerry, two, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, before we launch into that, um, I, I, I just, if we could just take a second, um, and if everybody could just uh, maybe, you know, just say your name, your position, where you're from, um, you know, take five seconds. Um, I just want to you know, demonstrate that we have commissioners, managers, fire officials, um, from around the Commonwealth, um, and uh, uh, just for we all know who one another is. That that um, is a great idea, John. And uh, let me let me uh, let me uh, let me show you how that will work here. Hold on a second. So everybody doesn't talk at once, okay? I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to read your name, okay? I'll read your you. name, and what you would do is you will unmute yourself and just give us your background. That'd be great. So we're we're gonna, and that means you got to pay attention too. You gotta pay attention. You gotta pay attention, which is a good thing. Uh, so uh, let's go with, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Catherine. Could you go please first? Hello, yes, my name is Catherine Carter. I am a commissioner in Upper Gwinnett Township and I am the safety liaison with the Fire Emergency and Police Department. Excellent, thank you. Next one will be Tom Bernou. Hi. Tom Verneau, manager, Lower Allen Township. Matthew Catlin. Hi, Matt Canland, manager, Upper Moreland Township. Thank you. Uh, Denise. Denise, you're still on mute. Hello, Denise Kuritz, Lower Moreland Township Commissioner. I serve as the vice president, and I've been on the board for almost two decades, proud to say. Very good. Next up is Ren. Uh, good afternoon, Ren Barto. I'm a commissioner at Patterson Township, suburb of Beaver Falls in Beaver County. I am the financial chair and the fire commissioner for the township. Got it, thank you. James McCoy is up next. Hello, folks. Jim McCoy. I am the acting chief of Lower Marion Township. Um, my boss decided to move to Harrisburg and take a country club job as new state fire commissioner. So I've been filling in for Chaz as he's been going. I've been a volunteer since 1985 and in the career fire department since 2005. 
Thank you. Ray Lauterbach. Ray Lauterbach, Fire Marshal for Tinicum Township, Delaware County. If you're familiar with the Philadelphia National Airport, two thirds of the, the airports in Tinicum. Uh, we are a combination fire and EMS department. Thank you. Hank Llewellyn. Yes, Hank Llewellyn, Commissioner, Upper Potts Grove Township, Montgomery County. Sounds good. Mike Golden. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Golden. I'm the chief of the Tinicum Township Fire Company in Delaware County, PA. And like my fire marshal just said, we're a combination department. Lee Fulton. I'm the Township Manager in Springfield, Delaware County, as well as the fire marshal. Nate Silcox. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I'm the executive director of the Senate Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness Committee in the, in the uh, state capitol and worked with Jerry on a number of issues on that front and also a Hampton Township uh, commissioner as well. Dave Hall. Hey, Jerry, Dave Hall, I'm the uh, public safety director for uh, Lower Allen Township uh, in Cumberland County. And uh, we have uh, two volunteer fire departments in uh, some career members uh, that are public safety uh, officers uh, that are part of the fire service as well. Thank you. Al Beanstock. Hi, I'm Al Beanstock, commissioner in Hampton Township. Thank you. Ed Glassman. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Glassman. I'm the chief of Upper Moreland Township. I Retired from the city of Camden after 35 years. I have a volunteer background for over 20 years in Gloucester City. And Upper Moreland is in the process of evaluating their fire department uh, moving forward. We have a part, it is a combination department. They were only working six in the morning, six at night on the career side. And then the volunteer staff handle overnight and the weekend. We were able to do some uh, creative financing and get a sixth person. So we staff five days a week, 24 hours with three people. And we're trying to look to see where the future holds for us, how we can be uh, economically feasible and provide a quality service to our residents. So I look forward to today's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin Erickson. Hi there, um, I am the government affairs representative with the Pennsylvania Municipal League, just here to listen in. Thank you. Derek Sawyer. Yeah, how's everybody doing? I'm Derek Sawyer, Fire Chief of the Upper Derby Township Fire Department, form, uh, retired Fire Commission Facility of Philadelphia, um, and we are a combination department. Thank you very much. Ted Middleman. I'll go with Amy Sturgis next. Hello, everyone. Um, I am the Deputy Executive Director for Advocacy for the Municipal League and the State Association of Township Commissioners. Caitlin and I work together on legislation and policy for the commissioners. And um, we are, as Caitlin said, here to listen to the discussion. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Amy. Catherine Carter. Uh, I already introduced myself. Oh, I am sorry. I got you out of the order there. Uh, I'll let Unless you. there's two Catherines, because I was the first Catherine. Okay, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, Alec Patnick, the time. Oh, hi. My name is Alok Patnick. I'm from Salisbury Township. I'm a commissioner in Salisbury Township, as well as a volunteer firefighter here, too. Excellent. Thank you. Tim Shuck. Good afternoon. I'm the Fire Marshal, Fire Service Administrator for Upper Dublin Township, Montgomery County. Thank you. Angela Kelly. Uh, Angela Kelly, the Fire Marshal Emergency Management Coordinator for Bethlehem Township. Scott Lynch. Good afternoon. I'm the Fire Marshal for Cheltenham Township. Thank you. Dustin Grove. Good afternoon, uh, Dustin Grove, Salisbury Township, Lehigh County, uh, two volunteer fire departments and I work for the township. Thank you, uh, Justin.
Okay. How about Joshua Wells? Joshua Wells, Fire Chief of Western Salisbury Volunteer Fire Company in Salisbury Township. Thank you. Sherry Chippo. Good afternoon, Sherry Chippo, Hampton Township Commissioner. Thank you. Josh Nagy. Good afternoon, Joshua Nagy, a Lower Allen Township Commissioner. Thank you. Colby Corina. Coriana. How you doing? My name is CJ Caroni. I'm the fire chief with Bethlehem Township Fire Company. Thank you. Uh, Liz McNally. McNady. Okay. Um, Mike McKell Waldron. Uh, might have uh, some audio issues, but uh, I'm going to move on to Jeff Wissener. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Wissner. I'm the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management Coordinator for the Town of McCandless in Allegheny County. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Andy Block. Hi, good afternoon. I'm the uh, Chief of Police for Upper Moreland Township, Montgomery County. In addition to that, I'm also the Deputy Fire Chief for Glavin Fire Company, which is part of the Lower Marion Fire Department. Thank you, Andy. Uh, David Percula. Hi, uh, Dave Probolka, Susquehanna Township here in Dauphin County. I'm the Township Manager. Thank you, Dave. Doug Gokenauer. Hi, I'm Doug Gokenauer. I'm the Fire Administrative Officer and Emergency Management Coordinator for Hampton Township, Cumberland County. Thank you, Doug. George Nettles. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Ed Rakowski, President of the Board and stand-in for George Needles, Manager of Upper Chichester Township. Uh, strictly volunteers, three fire departments. We're in a midst at, at, at this time of cons consolidating three fire companies. Well, good. We could uh, talk a little bit about that in some of our discussions also. Ken Felker. Ken Felker. Yes, yeah, Springfield Township, Delaware County, the Assistant Fire Chief. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Kevin Smith. Yeah, I'm the Deputy Fire Chief of a Volunteer Department in Butler Township, Butler, PA. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Chris Hoffman. Hi, I'm Chris Hoffman. I am the Township Manager in Lower Moreland Township in Montgomery County. Got it. Now, I am uh, I'm seeing names repeat in front of me. So if there are some people that I know I did not introduce yet or call, so would you please, if you did not, if I did not call your name, please introduce yourself. And I know we might have some people talking over each other, so just be cautious with that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charles Whiting, Commissioner from Upper Moreland Township. Hi, I'm Jason Singer, uh, Town of McCandless, Allegheny County Commissioner, liaison to the Volunteer Firefighter Steering Committee. Excellent. I'm Gwen Patterson. I'm the manager of Aleppo Township in Allegheny County. Thank you. And then Gerald, Commissioner from Haverford Township. Okay. Got that, Gerald. All righty. I think we've got uh, everybody, John. Thank Anybody you. else? That, yeah, th th thank you. Um, Scott, I think, do you do? Yeah, Scott Frederick, Director of Emergency Services for Butler Township. I uh, serve as the fire chief, fire marshal, and emergency management coordinator. Great. Th thank you all. Thank you, thank you for your service. In addition to my hat at Pennsylvania State Township uh, Commissioners, um, I'm also on the Wilkes-Barre Township uh, uh, Board, first-class township here in Luzerne County. I served as an EMA director in uh, Toby Hanna Township in Monroe County um, and have a, um, a background in volunteer fire service as well. Uh, thank you all for your service to the communities. Jerry, take it away. All righty, guys. Okay, so based on that survey that I sent, so if we were doing this seminar in person, we would uh, have be all sitting around in a circle and we talk about some of our greatest concerns 
about the future of your fire service organization. So this is what that survey, I know, uh, there, uh, you know, there's about 17 to 18 people that uh, responded to the survey. Um, and and where, where uh, you know, where this came out, I'm using the, uh, the word cloud function on survey, survey monkey is the greatest concern for the, you know, what is your greatest concern for your fire or EMS organization? And, and no, no, uh, no secret what came out is, is the data here is, you know, concerns about staffing, okay? Uh, concerns about uh, the volunteers, the number of volunteers that you have in, in an organization. Uh, does anybody have any off the top of their head that they would like to add of one of your greatest concerns, okay? And any of your greatest concerns beyond those things that I, I'm showing on the screen right now? I think my biggest concern is secession planning, um, whether it be leadership within the organization and then firefighters coming in the door. Okay, could you please just identify your name and what type of department are you from? Uh, Scott Frederick, uh, all volunteer department. Okay, uh, so your concern is again succession planning, which makes makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, you know because you have to look at who's on the bench to take over those key leadership positions in your organization. You know, again, our strong volunteer organization. You know, you have to have strong administration from the president, the vice president, the secretary, the treasurer, those key pieces, and. Uh, you know, from your administrator or your fireside. Dave Hall raised his hand. Dave. Yeah, Jerry, I, I think one of my biggest concerns is uh, the redundancy of uh, fire equipment and the lack of regional planning. Uh, every, every municipality basically uh, does their own planning for their own municipality. And really there's, I, I think that there needs to be a, a 35,000 foot view uh, so that you don't have uh, too many trucks, you know, too many uh, pieces of equipment, which taxpayers end up funding. So there needs to be some regional component uh, to that, as well as the staffing piece, because they go hand in hand. The number of pieces you have to staff goes hand in hand with the number of people you have to staff them. So, Dave, great point. Uh, I was out in western Pennsylvania last night and the night before, and I was meeting with some uh, township and fire department officials. And this chief told me that three years ago, we bought a brand new engine uh, and it was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And he just bid another one to be purchased this year to be the third. They have twins and they're adding another one. And it's now $750,000. So, and then in my normal speech, I usually say it's a $1.2 million aerial device. And then somebody corrected me last week and says it's now a $1.8 million aerial device. So that, that number is uh, gonna concern all of us. So regional planning, absolutely. Greatest concern. Anyone else have a greatest concern for your fire organization that may, may not be clearly identified here. So those were very good. Uh, staffing, okay, how, how many people we have. Uh, a succession plan for your organization, okay, a succession plan for your organization, very, very real, very true. And, and again, that regional plan and, and looking at the duplication of services and the amount of, uh, amount of equipment involved in that. So next, and, and I asked specifically three strengths of your fire service organization. And again, you can use these questions to assess how you are in, in working with your organization. And, and, and again, there's, there's a little bit all over the board with certain things, but what came out in the word cloud is, you know, the strength is, is training, okay? And uh, apparatus and equipment. Uh, dedicated volunteers and, and equipment, which uh, that, that pretty much lines up with uh, what, what I've experienced, what many of us experience. You know, in, in the areas that I have identified, uh, the areas that I've identified where you come from, the first class townships, there's plenty of opportunities for our members to attend training and things like that. You get into other areas of Pennsylvania, the access is a little, little challenging at times. So greatest strengths of our organizations right there. And, and like anything else, I wanna, I'll, I'll talk to you about the, the, the greatest weaknesses, okay? The greatest weaknesses and, and not surprisingly, you know, those were the identified greatest weaknesses uh, that, that we showed. 
Now, I, I also, uh, I do want to jump, um, I do want to jump uh, to another document very quickly for you guys to look at. And do you guys see that? You see that okay? Okay. Um, this is the question that was asked, how has your municipality responded to the challenges facing the fire service? Because I am hoping that many of you understand what we've been doing at the state level uh, since the SR6 was published. Uh, this is not a new issue. And if anybody doesn't know these are new issues, uh, they're really not following what's happening across Pennsylvania. And we all should be leaning forward even more now. Um, and, and, you know, the, some of the things that, that you posted here and, and you gave feedback on is what, what is your municipality, how has your municipality responded to those challenges? Because many of you may be thinking about, you know, what do we do next? How do we do things next? What are they looking at? And I, I just highlighted some of the some of the concepts. Uh, you know, I'm just highlighting some of the, 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 the trends that I that I saw on the survey. OK, um, uh, providing manpower through public works and code enforcement to supplement staffing shortages. And, and that's that's a pretty common thing. Uh, you know, increasing recruitment, uh, having a common recruitment campaign. That that's uh, we're going to talk a lot about that in our next webinar. We're going to talk about the the, the specific vol the, the mo most modern volunteer recruitment. What's going on right now in, in, in the world with that? Establishing a steering committee. Number five. Now, the, comp the 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 most important thing in challenges, and you'll see as part of the presentation, is that communication with the volunteer organization and the legacy organizations that you see uh, in 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 your area. And I'm I'm kind of familiar with some of the areas. That, that you're from. And, and again, you know how the volunteer system has evolved over the years, and, and many of them are all separate organizations. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, this year it says, uh, you know, number six, whoever responded to that, the municipality hired a fire chief to manage the, the volunteer department. Uh, there's number seven, identified, you know, municipal, the municipal government is starting to push for consolidation of two fire departments discussions about a career chief and uh, a transition, okay? And, and again, all those things are things that have happened across Pennsylvania, and we could use this forum and other forums to, to help uh, talk about that. Um, you know, the township supports them with offers of assistance with grant writing and bookkeeping support. That, that's, that's a common thing. You know, uh, here's another thing that was very interesting that came in on the survey that I thought was very good is with leadership elections came a new chief and leaders willing to recruit and train members. And, and I can tell you that is one of the challenges that I hear, uh, I hear more regularly than, than, I, than I like to hear is, you know, you know, I, I, I know the situations where there's been a fire chief gets, gets along very well with the township commissioners gets along with the township manager. And then at the end of the year, there's an election and there's a new chief in and chaos reigns for the next couple of months. So it looks like from, from number 10 who responded that there's a, the, and, and that's the concern that all of you have when it comes to the selection process that you use to select officers for these very important positions, okay? There's been organizations in Pennsylvania, volunteer organizations that have moved to a more professional uh, selection process for volunteer leaders. And uh, at the municipal summit in Pittsburgh in October, we're going to have one of those fire chiefs as part of the panel from West Manchester Township, York County. Again, they're not a first class township, but uh, they've, they've been successful in that process. Uh, at number 13, again, employed an emergency services director to oversee uh, the department. Uh, number 14, that shift in stipend programs was formed to have firefighters stationed at the firehouse during specific weekday hours. Okay, that, that has become a more and more popular thing in, in different areas across Pennsylvania, those shift in stipend programs. And, uh, you know, there's a variety of different ones, and I, I track those, uh, and I follow those. Um, there's some more work in this township who, who respond to initial plans to hire a chief or director of emergency services as a joint municipal employee. 
Uh, there's some number 15 talked about part-time firefighters and number 16 talked about recruiting. Okay. Uh, I'm going to continue to march through some of these things quickly again, because we only have a short period of time here for our, uh, for our piece, for our, for our seminar today. Now, again, yeah, if you'd like Jerry, to go ahead. If, go ahead. Jerry, if I could just make one comment, there's a common thread that we just saw in that question and it's in its in its career it's paid it's it's cost um and, and i say this with all due respect but you know uh, we're looking at additional costs in, in a rising environment where equipment costs more and all that so one of the fundamentals looking at it from a from a commissioner standpoint um and a taxpayer is we have to do what we need to do more effectively and and one of our colleagues mentioned re regionalization but you know how are we going to fund this and i think we're all in agreement that there's going to be more costs that are involved in this just by nature of you know things going up but also we're going to have to put more money to it and and, and i support that but where is that going to come from and when, what does that look like and how do we fund that going forward uh, just as a thought that something that jumped out at me here is that um you know all of us are looking at how we're going to fund whatever whatever we're going to come up with but but thank you no problem, John. That that, that I, I have no problem. You know, keep keep jumping in there like that with that position. And if John, if you would monitor any of the things that come in on the chat, also I, I'd appreciate that too, if, yeah. if if that would be possible. And again, you know, I asked the question about how do you coordinate. And again, if we were in class together, we would be asking these questions and we'd be going around the room. Okay. Um, one of the most important things here is as fire commissioner, meet regularly with the chief officers and the president of the fire company, okay? That is a best practice in Pennsylvania is to have some sort of fire steering committee and executive committee. Some people call them the big five meeting. Uh, those are best practice in, in the integration between the townships and our fire service organizations, that there is ongoing communications, there's important communications, strategic communications, you know, some people, you know, if you look, somebody responded on number seven, okay, people take a hands-off approach with no real oversight. Uh, elected officials are reluctant to make hard decisions in fear of upsetting a volunteer, okay? And, and to be honest with you guys, if that is a comment that I do hear on a regular basis. Uh, I hear that uh, on a regular basis. Um, communication and coordination is done through meetings, okay? Um, attendance at meetings, okay, a liaison function, a liaison function, uh, fire service to communication through a fire service director position and, and things like that. So uh, again, good feedback, very important on that uh, as through, through our classroom here. And uh, one more, two of those, the concept of strategic planning. Again, I'm a big fan of it, okay, the concept of strategic planning. You know, that I asked that question about strategic planning. Some are doing it, some are not doing it. Uh, getting people around the table and talking about the future, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats, uh, develop some objectives and, and see how we can work together. How do we design, especially those of you that spoke about, you know, what does the future of this look like? And, and what are the uncomfortable, strategic planning allows us to have some of those uncomfortable conversations about the uh, about the future of our organization and and it allows for an open forum okay uh, you know uh, Jared and I have uh, done you know he understands how I do some seminars for some other organizations and it's a big room with a bunch of different people and we start talking and we get 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 making sure that everybody at, who has a seat at the table speaks and, and gets a chance to talk about their concerns expectations. Okay, uh, we did ask, you know, you as an elected official, those of you that are a commissioner, okay, clearly figuring out what are your expectations from the fire department? You know, what, what do you feel, you know, you know, because again, I'm sure you get communication every day from citizens calling with concern about the paving and you know, uh, you know, something to do with the roads or something to do with uh, garbage pickup or those type of things. Um, but, but what, you know, what do you, you know, you may not be hearing about the fire service because again, the fire department operates pretty much day to day, you know, get the job done. 
you know, unless you have some sort of high profile incident, okay, where there is, you know, a lot of people that are, that are hurt in the community. Uh, and I'll show you one high profile incident at the end of the presentation. Uh, but there's been some very high profile incidents across Pennsylvania within the last two months where there's been multiple fire deaths, multiple fire deaths. Now, I, I don't know if it has anything, and I have not researched, you know, anything about a response time from the fire department to those incidents, or they were more, they were more in, in smaller rural communities. Um, but, but again, you know, understanding from you as commissioners, okay, you as um, elected officials or managers of uh, uh, communities, you know, you know, and if you have an all volunteer system or a combination system where the career staff goes home at a certain time, okay, is there a chance that the fire truck is not going to get on scene in a reasonable amount of time? And, and again, we'll talk a little bit about a reasonable amount of time later in the, in, in the, in the uh, seminar. But if you know that, what are you doing and how are you working toward ensuring that the fire truck shows up? So, you know, some of your comments back, you know, to provide the best service at the best cost of the township, seamless delivery, uh, remain an all volunteer, actively recruit new members. That's an expectation. You know, provide uh, best training and response, prompt professional response, you know, autonomy and administrative functions. Um, you know, respond to emergencies with the appropriate amount of certified firefighters in a timely manner uh, prescribed by NFPA 1720. And we'll talk about that. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that in a little bit. I asked a question from, uh, for fire service officials. So I hear there's a lot of chiefs uh, or fire service officials on, uh, on. And, you know, I asked that question, if you're a leader in a fire service organization, you know, what are your expectations of the elected officials? Okay. And I encourage that when I teach uh, seminars to uh, volunteer leaders, you know, talk to your commissioners, talk to your supervisors, talk to borough council. What, what do they, what, what is that? You know, uh, what, what's going on? And here's an expectation to provide the tools and resources, uh, engagement and understanding of the responsibilities, uh, cooperation, transparency, and support, okay, Th those type of things. Um, support the fire department and support uh, the organization and, and independence for operations, okay. And again, some of the ways that we've been doing things in the past, you know, may not be able to continue in the future, especially when we start to talk about, you know, the costs of operations and, and those type of things, the cost of uh, apparatus replacement and, and, and those type of uh, those type of challenges. Again, the at last question here, I think one of the last ones, and then I'll move on to more of the education session. What are the innovative things that you're doing? And we're gonna, you know, again, I, I, again, I did send this out to people because we are always looking for innovative things across Pennsylvania on what are we doing good? Okay, what are we doing to make sure that fire service is supported? We're moving forward with things. Um, again, the concept of recruiting, we are gonna get into a lot more detail of that at the next seminar, but I'm a huge fan of something called a Citizens Fire Academy. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next seminar. You know, working at the state level, working at the local level, working at the county level. Uh, we were very successful in Cumberland County to uh, the county commissioners agreed to give uh, a, uh, a tax credit for all of our volunteer fire and EMS personnel in Cumberland County, the first one in um, the state. Now, it's only a $250 one, which is good. So I'm very happy with that. But that recognizes mm -hmm. the importance uh, of that, that that there was legislation authorized at the state level to allow that to happen. And this would not have happened if it was not our local commissioners advocating to the county commissioners to do this, okay? It came that way. And I, I get a lot of questions about those type of programs across the Commonwealth too. So that's just uh, some of the surveys that came back. Uh, 
and the surveys that came back. And, and I'm going to switch back over to my PowerPoint. And while I'm doing that, does anybody have any specific questions or specific uh, things they'd like to bring up at this time? A little bit. Any specific questions based on based on my previous discussion that I just did there? All right, you guys still hear me, correct? You hear me, John, correct? Yeah, definitely. Would, would it be helpful that, um, you know, Jerry, one thing I was thinking of, um, if we had those questions just in a survey that we can give to each of the townships um, and they put it out to their members and, and or elected officials, um, senior management, um, and then we gather all that collectively and we say here, so both the township could use that internally, but then we have, 54 townships or whatever that would participate in this. Um, and then we could send it out to everybody. Here's what some common themes were around the state, just as a follow-up, um, you know, November, December, January, whatever, just a thought, uh, throw that out there for. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, so as we get into this part, um, you know, when you, you know, again, it, how fire departments began in Pennsylvania, okay, and understanding the history of it, but unless you were a city, okay, and we, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, former Commissioner Sawyer on board with Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and a lot of the boroughs, those fire departments have been around for many years, okay, borough fire departments, 1800s, okay, many of the volunteer fire departments in Pennsylvania, their birth date is in the you know, the late, uh, early 1950s, okay, after the Korean War, when the suburbs started to expand, and, and um, the communities in the suburbs of Pennsylvania started to expand. Fire departments were not particularly part of government in those organizations. They're nonprofit corporations. They're separate, okay? And as Pennsylvania changed over the years, moving into the the, the 1980s and 1990s, when professional nonprofit administration began began to to take hold, and fire a lot of the fire departments that operated on bylaws and charters and things became nonprofits, which are separate, totally separate uh, organizations. And understanding that in Pennsylvania, you know, most fire departments are not part of government. How, and, and you go out of state and you go to other things, you know, they are part of government. However, in areas as, as transition has occurred, those of you that are in the Philadelphia suburbs who have combination departments already, uh, you know, you understood, some of you have been around for many, many years, uh, have, have, have had fire marshal's offices that have had paid staff that are part of government. And then there is that kind of relationship with the all volunteer company. But you as township officials need to ask the question, okay, do you have confidence that your current organization can perform? Okay, can, you, can they perform the basic and advanced functions that they say they can perform? Okay, there's a, the complexity of firefighting, rescue, and many other things have changed. We are not just a fire service organization in Pennsylvania. We are an all hazard organization. And the complexity of the training, okay, to do all those good things for the community is, is higher than anything before. And one of the fastest growing specialties in Pennsylvania is water rescue, okay? There are more fire companies that are standing up water rescue teams uh, now than I've ever seen, okay? And that comes with its own challenges and, and a need in some communities. And, and then you have to ask your, yourself a question is, you know, these, you know, can you tolerate a certain level of drama that comes with working with separate organizations, okay? Because a lot of the people that are involved in our volunteer fire, our service, are, they're dedicated people, okay? They're very proud people. But again, again, but, but at times, you know, there's drama that comes in those organizations. And when it comes time to, uh, you know, maybe do something a little bit different, you know, there may be some, some pushback that is not always positive in community, community relationship. But assessing, assessing your relationship, and that's what it's all about, okay? The, 
and I will say this, I've said it in, in every one of my seminars and I said it Monday night in Pittsburgh or suburban Pittsburgh and, and Tuesday night is the most successful fire service organizations in Pennsylvania, the most successful are the ones that have an excellent relationship with their township commissioners, okay? Their local government, that there is a honest, honest communication, there's positive communication, um, that, that, that they know and understand each other. And it goes beyond just showing up at the fire company banquet at the end of the year, okay? It's that ongoing understanding and, and having at times having those discussions or those difficult, those difficult discussions, if, if there's a breakdown in that relationship, okay? If there is a breakdown in that relationship. So I, I cannot stress to you enough, you know, I follow all the media accounts, that are, the media things that happen in Pennsylvania. You know, all you got to, there's a story in a certain part of Pennsylvania right now where there's a challenge between a township and a fire company, okay? So, and it's all over the media. So you gotta ask some of these questions, okay? You gotta ask some of these questions and, and kind of work through that. And, and again, each one of these has a certain level of, of, you have an investment because there's some townships that I'm familiar with that cover 95% of the fire company budget. They own the stations, they own the apparatus. And there's some, Townships in Pennsylvania where they have a fire tax and they write they, the fire tax generates the slightly over a million dollars and they uh, divide that fire tax in two because there is two fire companies and they give the money to the fire companies to, to do what they want with it. Okay. But, you know, we have the traditional way of doing things in Pennsylvania and there's the concept of modernization. What, what does a modern fire service look like? Okay, you know, comes down to all, you know, who, who's in charge? Okay, who, who is in charge? And obviously many of you know, through, through the township code, you guys know clearly who has the responsibility for ensuring fire service. Okay, and that's the township officials. You know, you should have a very clear picture on how much money does this all cost? Okay, what does the staffing, your current staffing cost? Okay. What does your volunteer system cost? What does the capital improvement program look like? Okay, you know, and again, we've had talk, you know, originally, you know, with our first opening comments today, uh, Director Hall is very concerned about the concept that, you know, that looking at the concept of regional, uh, you know, looking at from a big picture when it comes to these very expensive pieces of equipment. You know, who's responsible, okay? When one of the firefighters uh, in your organization uh, has a fight and, and uh, knocks someone out or they have a domestic dispute or uh, so one of the chief officers in your fire company gets a DUI, okay? How is that handled, okay? Is there a process, okay? Some townships have a hands-off approach to that. Let's let the fire company handle, okay? We've also had areas in Pennsylvania where there are firefighters that have certain background. Their background is not clean, but the fire company allows them to continue to operate. Okay. How do we ensure that the community continues to get served? Okay. Who makes decisions? How do we collaborate? Okay. And again, I don't advocate or Jared or, or, or the people that I associate with and we work with on a regular basis, we don't advocate a big old takeover and stuff like that. I, I don't advocate those type of things. But I advocate in, in our, you know, we, 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 you really need to sit down and have those difficult discussions. When you look at the traditional way of doing things, okay, and, and one of the classic examples is, you know, is, you know, you get some volunteer leaders in your organization that, you know, may be toxic leaders. Okay, and how do you deal with that? How, how does that work and how does that happen? So here's some, here's some you know, this is, this is the bottom line that you guys need to understand, okay? So you guys are the policy makers, the township commissioner policies decisions, okay? And you really have to sit down and think and talk in, in your meeting is, you know, 
how much involvement do we want to have in the fire service? Okay. Now, some of you on this call already have quite a bit of quite a bit of involvement because some of you are paid fire chiefs, fire fire officials, fire marshals. You may have a staff. Okay. But there's some commissioners on here that are commissioners from all volunteer companies. Okay. But asking that question, how much involvement? Uh, do you want to take responsibility for the fire service? And what does that responsibility look like? Okay. You know, what does, what, what, who, what does that look like? What does that responsibility look like? What do you, you know, how do you encourage, you know, collaboration? Okay. What, what, what is that? You know, there's that, you know, the hands-off approach versus active participation and, and decision making. So I, I, this is a good point in the seminar, just to throw that out. Does anybody have any feedback on this, this policy, this policy decision type thing that you as a commissioner may have to make? So anybody interested in talking about maybe a challenge that they've had in this, or have you had any policy decisions from a township commissioner level on your involvement in the fire service? Okay. All right. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to, I'm going to continue to move forward. Okay. John, can you hear me? Okay. I'm a little nervous. It's uh, silent. So. I can hear you fine. Hear you fine. Good. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I, and and I, I think part of it is, is that, um, you know, depending on the township, you have a lot of, um, you know, there, there's a political component. Um, you know, how do you, um, how do you navigate some of that so, so some of that politics, but Dustin, I think Dustin, your hand's up. Dustin's up. Yes, thank you, Dustin. I'll I'll talk a little bit about. It. I think I'm not sure if the township I work in is similar to any of the other municipalities, but the throughout Pennsylvania, the fire companies are treated as like a quasi government uh, municipal fire department, but it's also funded privately because they get. Uh, 501c, all these other different sources of funding, private donations, donations from citizens, but they don't really want to be told what to do with the money, even if they get money from the township. Uh, the township just wants to make sure that they spend their money adequately and frugally and not just to, because a new nozzle came out, we go buy new nozzles for everything. We want to make sure that it's spent to, that they have everything they need to complete the mission at hand. But uh, I think that nobody really wants oversight especially when it comes to something that's operational. Got it. Very, very good. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else want to add to that? Well, good. Let me, let me continue to move on here. So again, understanding your role and we're going to move into that governance factor just for your, for your world. Okay. And understanding again, I've got my blue arrow there. Yeah. You know, you know what your roles are as township officials. Okay, you 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 follow the township code, and you you have certain ordinances and resolutions, and you have some. Most townships have some professional staff, some, some managers, some professional staff members, and and then volunteer fire companies. Fire companies are the you know the 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 two that we see in Pennsylvania. The clearly the most common one is that you know the five hundred one c three, five hundred one c four. Fire companies, nonprofit corporations, membership-driven organizations, where they're the most all of the decisions uh, are are made by the members of the organization. Okay, uh, they're they're governed by bylaws. They're governed by bylaws. Uh, they have uh, administrative policies, uh, operational guidelines. Okay, and and there's also that comp that that volunteer firemen's relief association, which is a very important part of equip purchasing certain insurance equipment and things and there's a whole governing process behind that so you see there's one model that i'm showing right now that is you know those of you that have to deal with what i look at right here is you know one township one fire company the complexity level is not that bad right there not that bad here's another one okay where life becomes a little more challenging for those of you that are in this situation okay Life becomes a little more challenging for those of you that are in this situation. And, and what, that, 
what this what this challenge is is not only do you have to deal with one volunteer fire company and I, I maybe that's not the right word to say is deal with but collaborate with is there's two fire companies and i have an example of three and four there because there's some municipalities in pennsylvania that have multiple fire companies so what that does it raises a level of complexity for you as a township government in regards to some decision making and funding and personalities and challenges because each one of those fire companies okay has a different personality or a different culture okay and and how this normally rolls out is you know you know say there's two or three fire companies in, in the municipality in some places they take uh, the funding that is received by the citizens and maybe you allocate funding and they divide it by two and give each fire company or they divide it by three. But in reality, what happens in some places, not all fire companies provide the same level of service. OK, for example, fire company number one could have a leadership culture that believes in firefighter training, firefighter one certification, weekly training um, and making sure that we have uh, effective apparatus and equipment. Fire company number two, you know, and, and fire company number one, by the way, gets out on every call. Okay, they get out on every single call. They're able to continue to respond on their their emergencies. Okay, uh, fire company number two, well, not so much. You know, I was told by a municipal official a couple of weeks ago that their volunteer fire company, sixty percent of the time, cannot get out on calls. Okay. Um, and then a variety of different things that do occur. Okay. Then what happens is there's a fight because of the funding, because we're funding them equal, but they're not equal. So your challenges are increasing the more fire companies that you have involved. Okay. And again, some of the solutions in working through that is having a steering committee, uh, having the honest discussions about what is our minimums that we're going to accept for, for standards and, and how do we work through that. OK, and there's been some situations in Pennsylvania where, you know, a fire department becomes ineffective and the municipality loses confidence in that fire company. OK, and 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 uh, no longer permits them to respond to calls. And, and again, that that has a lot of challenges and that should always be a last resort of, of doing. It. Here's another model. OK, in Pennsylvania that we see. Hey, Jerry, real quick. Can I just yes. jump in on something? Um, so just to go back, if you'll just go back one slide, please. Um, so as Jerry starts to discuss about the effectiveness of fire departments, especially whenever you have multiple within your, your uh, township, um, if everybody's familiar with the ISO, you know, the, the third party company that works on behalf of the insurance uh, industry, you know, to evaluate fire departments. Now, granted, fire departments only account for 50% of that overall total, but that's still a large total to get you your grade. ISO in the past has always just given one single number or one single grading for an individual municipality. ISO is now changing it to where they're going to grade under what's called a fire service responsibility area. So even if, if within your township, you could have multiple fire departments, but what you may find is, depending on how, how they operate, how they do things, if they're following kind of, you know, some of those NFPA standards, if they're getting out for calls, if they're doing their training, you may have one fire department that has a better grade than another one within your own township, within your own boundary line. So that's something to, uh, you know, consider whenever you're talking about the multiple departments, um, you know, how they're doing things, how they're operating, because, you know, you could have on one side of the street in your township, one ISO grade, and on the other side of the street, you could end up with a completely different grade. So um, just something to be aware of. Thank you. Ex excellent for bringing that up. And I wanted to add something. This is a look here um, from Salisbury Township. I think that was an excellent point, uh, Jared. Uh, I wanted to highlight that ISO only goes by the statistics of claims filing processing. So if you look at an hour, um, like if I'm going back and looking at the 500 calls we run per year per hour station, um, I, would, I would highly doubt like maybe 15 or 20 of them are filed for insurance claims. So, you know, whereas if we look at our challenges, the staffing and resources and everything we need goes for every single call. Um, understand, you know, totally understood that ISO definitely represents a significant amount of value in terms of the claims and the losses and everything else. 
But we also have to look beyond that because there are a lot of calls we get recalled, but we still have to respond. A lot of calls, we just have to show up. There's just minor thing that we have to do. We still need staffing for those. How do we address in the overall grand scheme of our situation? And that's important for us to think as well. Excellent. And I think Dustin, you raised your hand also. Dustin, did you raise your hand or not? No, I raised my hand before, sorry. Oh, okay, not, not a problem, okay. I'm gonna move right on. Okay, some of you have already transitioned to some sort of combination department. Here's a, the, the governance on a combination department. Again, and, and what this model is, to be honest with you right here is, this model is the fire company is the employer of the firefighters or, or employees, okay? Where you have the township government, okay? Uh, and this is several places across Pennsylvania has this model where uh, the combination fire department, the department is the employer, okay? The department is the employer, uh, not the municipality. And, and correct me, Jared, that's how you work, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So Western Berks, we are a 501c3, but we do employ uh, seven full-time people, including myself. Got it, got it. And I think this is my final model uh, that we have. Well, this is, this is the final model right here, is uh, where uh, in, in Pennsylvania there is, you know, you have the township government and then you have a fire department uh, that is part of township government where the fire chief and or firefighters are employees of the township. They follow policies and procedures uh, developed by the fire department for the, the township. And then there is a volunteer fire company that is a part, either part of that or, or excuse me, that, that is an independent volunteer fire company, okay, that uh, reports to uh, the Department of Fire and Rescue Services. So those are, those are the most common methods of governance uh, throughout Pennsylvania for the fire service organizations, okay? Now, uh, as we continue to move on, uh, one of the things that is extremely important for you to understand is the concept of effective governance of those volunteer organizations, okay? And again, um, some townships provide millions of dollars a year into operating fire companies. However, those fire companies need to make sure that they're following the standards for nonprofit administration. Uh, the most important thing is having a, an excellent set of bylaws. Meeting minutes are very, very important in those organizations. And that there is an actual budget with effective financial planning. And that's where one of our participants talked about is that succession planning, okay? Because I could walk into many fire stations across Pennsylvania and there's one guy that's been the treasurer for the last 25 years and there's not many people that wanna take that job as, as, as treasurer, okay? Um, and, and that's where we have a challenge. And what I have on the right of the screen is there are training programs throughout Pennsylvania uh, that um, are able to bring up uh, and, and, and teach those important skills of effective nonprofit management. And, and the program is called the Fire and EMS Administrative Officer course as part of the, the Pennsylvania State Fire Academy and, and PANO, the Pennsylvania Association of, of Nonprofits. So that's very important. It's very important because again, even though, you know, it's a separate organization. You have to have an interest in this to the fact that, you know, when, when some of these things go wrong in Pennsylvania, it's usually because of some sort of breakdown in the nonprofit uh, management, you know, an inability to manage the HR related things, uh, uh, you know, the financial things start to break down. Whenever we see something come out in the press, you know, whenever there's some sort of financial scandal and stuff like that. And again, when you look and what I mean by that, and how, how your interest in this as township officials need to be is, you know, what's that number you're providing the fire company a year? Okay, what does that look like? That, you know, are you providing them half a million a year? Are you providing them 100,000? What, what does that look like? And, you know, obviously the more, the more funding you provide them, the, the more, um, you know, the more interest in, in, in making sure that you have effective governance. So. Very, very important. The second most important thing uh, that, that we have seen 
in our volunteer organizations. Okay, the number one factor of success in the volunteer fire service uh, is, is leadership. Okay, uh, the right person in the right position. Okay, you've got to have all that governance stuff and the, the bylaws and all that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to leading that organization, okay, um, which is very difficult in today's world, to be very honest with you. I've talked to many fire chiefs that are in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that are ready to retire and move on. And they're very, very concerned um, because there's, they don't have people that are willing to step up because it truly is a, a, a heavy position, okay, uh, of, your, of your chief officer. So again, there are leadership development programs in Pennsylvania, okay? Uh, and, and I would encourage you that if you ever have any suggestions in, in you know, your leaders of these departments, uh, who's going to be a leader, it's all great to be that tactical firefighter and being able to put Put the, uh, put the fire out and do the extrication. But when you become a chief officer, uh, 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 the D chief or the deputy chief, you're 80% of the time you're dealing with the administrative issues, okay, in a department, okay? And getting that right person in the right position is so, so important. And, and I have seen, uh, I've seen that numerous times where, where, you know, things go a lot better. And that, now again, uh, that I, I'm, uh, you know, Jerry, do you have anything to add on that? Um, and I'm, I can move on. No, I'm good, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> Some of your best practices, and I'm not going to go over, uh, I'm not going to go over all of these because uh, I believe we're scheduled to go to three, three o'clock. I think. I think there's a two hour, I think this was a two hour seminar. So, yeah. uh, and, and that's good. That's a good two hours is enough to be on one of these things. And, and, you will get this uh, PowerPoint. So, so again, here is some of the, the check boxes, and I I have a uh, I have a, uh, a a checklist of best practices for for nonprofit management. But these are the kind of things that you should kind of make sure that uh, that you have, like defining a, re a reporting relationship between the township and the nonprofit. There's, there's many places in Pennsylvania that are still using a handshake method of a relationship, okay? Is it a committee, a liaison, a fire commissioner, you know, a full-time staff member? You know, what does that look like, okay? And performance, assessment, performance. So the last part of this, the, the final part of the seminar before we continue to move on is that expectations of service, okay? And, and what should the community expect or what does it look like uh, when you um, when you have a fire call and how many people now again uh, one of our participants very 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 important said about that staffing on many other things okay so you will learn that when you develop a staffing plan or, or a standard of cover okay you can uh, you know break down what they look like um, so, you know, why should you have standards? Why are they important? Uh, again, to measure what you are, what you say you are doing. When you are spending uh, eight hundred thousand dollars on an air on a on a fire engine, a pumper, okay, and uh, that pumper uh, does not leave the station on forty percent of the calls, okay, um, should should you know what what's the issue with that? There's a fire company that I worked with two years ago that they just bought a brand new piece of equipment and they had no interior firefighters. Okay. And that was a challenge. Okay. You know, you know, it's very important to kind of measure what we are doing. And, and again, uh, you know, reporting the results. Okay. Reporting the results. How many interior firefighters are responding to calls on a regular basis? If you ask your fire chief right now, you know, what's the, most people report what's called an average staffing. And so we have an average of 12 people. We have an average of eight people. Well, the problem is you gotta, you gotta filter that data a little bit out because where they're getting that information is from the report. And, and that also includes if they have any junior firefighters that have responded, if they have had fire police members that have responded, you know, or if there's people that showed up at the station after the call, they still get counted on the list. 
you know, we're not trying to embarrass any fire companies or anything like that, but the important data that you as a commissioner need to know is how many trained interior firefighters or rescue personnel are responding on calls, okay? And, and that is a really important number to look at, okay? Because that will, that will, because that, that person is qualified by the fire chief to enter a building into a very dangerous environment, a very dangerous environment. And we, we all have to admit, this is not a normal volunteerism, okay? Uh, normal volunteerism for Jerry is, is I volunteer once a month at uh, New Hope Ministries here in Mechanicsburg, okay? And that's a food bank. That's what normal people do. You know, Jerry also volunteers as a fire chief, and I go into dangerous situations on Interstate 81 on a regular basis. Jerry. So, uh, you know, one of the things whenever you're talking about your data collection and being able to show, you know, how you're, how you're measuring up, I'm assuming that most people on here, your fire departments are probably using the emergency reporting software. Um, that's what the state fire commissioner's office and the state had actually paid for, for every fire department in the Commonwealth to get it for free. It's the basic package. And what that does is that allows the state to pull that data, which is for ENFERS, the National Fire Incident Reporting System, um, that gets sent off to the U.S. Fire Administration. And then that's how they look at, you know, the number of structure fires, are they up, are they down? Um, but your, your fire department, if you have that basic package, you know, it's, it's, you really have to learn, you know, how to just use it, you know, more than just kind of like some of the basic, you know, you know, required boxes that you have to check or fill in. And it's very easy for, you know, fire departments to collect that data on, you know, how many volunteer, you know, how many junior firefighters do I have responding? How many interior, how many exterior, um, you know, as Jerry had talked about that average number, well, you could break that down. You know, you could say our last structure fire, our working structure fire, how many interior qualified people did I have versus how many exterior qualified people did I have? Um, you know, and as it starts to evolve this PowerPoint, you, know, you get down to a couple slides talking about some NFPA standards. The other nice thing with emergency reporting is that you can actually do data sharing amongst other fire departments. So as we get down and start to talk about the 1710, you know, you as a individual fire company may not meet that standard, but if you share your data with other agencies and you pull that data together, um, you know, you'll be able to get there. So we'll, we'll definitely discuss that a little bit more then. I just wanted to touch on it real quick. There was a couple other hands up uh, that I quickly saw. Anybody would like to add to that? John? Yeah, uh, Jared, do you want to go first? I saw somebody else's hand up. Um. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to follow up with Jared. You're, you're right. And, and maybe we could use that information that, that when you're looking at whether it be regional and one of our colleagues had mentioned, uh, um, you know, uh, how do we quantify that from a, from a political and a, and, a, and a financial perspective? If you say that here are the calls in this township, in this borough and in, in this township uh, together, here's where the majority of calls are. If we're looking at building a new station, where does it make sense? Um, is it where the volunteers live or where the calls are? Um, looking at the future, but here's the, here's the actual numbers on the ground, and especially when you're trying to promote this to the community, say, here's why we want to spend $2.5 million on a new fire station, here's why, and here's why it needs to be on this section or this section, because um, here's the numbers, not just what Billy at the v VFW thinks, but it's really what the numbers are displaying and where we're going. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Jerry, just to follow up with John real quick, um, no, that's it's important because you know, if for any of your townships, you know, if you have a really good, like, you know, GIS department or the ability to incorporate the fire data into mapping, I mean, it's huge. Like, you're talking about building a new firehouse. Well, where do you put the new fire station? Do you put it where you have the calls, like John said? Do you put it where your volunteers live? Or do you put it where you have the highest population density? Because as we look at data in my agency, you know, we know that a majority of our calls are where our population density is the highest. Not saying that our, our residents that live further out in the more, um, you know, rural areas aren't as important, but, you know, we may only go out there once or twice a month compared to, you know, 50, 60 times a month somewhere else. So it, it said it's really important to, to learn how e emergency reporting works. They have tons of classes on it, um, you know, for, and I, I hate to say it, but, you know, get the millennials within your fire departments to really sit down 
and you know learn the process because those are the ones that are going to pick it up very quickly. And I'm not I'm not bashing anybody from any other generations, but um, you know those are the ones that are going to work that computer stuff really well and really get into the nuts and bolts on how it works. Excellent. So most of you know, uh, time is the most important thing in a fire. Okay, that's the traditional way that fire departments have been measured for many many years. Okay. The longer it takes to get there, the greater percentage of property destruction, okay? Beyond when the fire starts, and, and all of you, there's a video online of, you could Google it on YouTube when the Christmas tree catches on fire and they do a demonstration, you know, within three minutes, the whole room is engulfed in flames and things like that. But uh, the ability to track time, okay, when our fire departments are notified. So there's two different models of deployment in Pennsylvania, okay? There's a come from home volunteer model where uh, the volunteers are paged, they uh, leave, their stage, leave their home, drive to the station, drive to the scene, uh, and then start firefighting operations. Then we have the deployment model when, there, when there's crews in station. Okay, and those crews and station may be live in volunteers, they may be fully career, they may be public safety officers, they may be volunteers that are in station. Okay, the travel time to the incident that you know, we can't really do too much on travel time because the roadways are what the roadways are. Okay, uh, we can't do too much about you know, when we're on, you know, when we're on the scene, we could initiate firefighting operations pretty quickly, pretty quickly with, uh, you know, training and, and advancement on that. But, but again, where you make up time, you know, where you make up time is that deployment model, okay? And, and do you choose to have firefighters at the station, okay, where some places across Pennsylvania have determined that's, that's what, what they want, that's the system they have, or do they want to continue with the come from home model? Okay, and that should be based upon your call volume, your risk assessment, and, and things like that. So when you, when you look at that. The next is, uh, Jerry, you want to talk a little bit about, so I want to talk about a deployment model of multiple municipalities responding to fire calls. Okay, your home company and automatic aid ass assessment. And this is how you need to assess as a township official, what does that first alarm or that initial alarm response to? Now we are talking about a dispatch of a house fire, a strip mall fire, a, a actual fire. So there's a lot of different classifications of dispatch, a car accident, a, a tree down, a wires down, and all of them require some sort of deployment model. Okay, some sort of deployment model. Where you need to kind of look at, and, and, and every county has this set up a little bit differently, and they, they call them box alarms, alarm cards, or something like that. If somebody dials 911, okay, if somebody dials 911, and there is a, uh, there's a report of a house fire, you know, on my street, where I, where if you look behind me, if there's a fire, it's going to get this, okay? What you're gonna say in front of me is, there are multiple municipalities that are involved in every response pretty much in Pennsylvania, except, you know, city of Philadelphia, city of Pittsburgh, you know, uh, maybe a bigger township in the Philadelphia suburbs, or maybe State College, for example, uh, you know, uh, in the center region. But what we have to assess beyond our own company, okay, so for we have equipment response, and then we have a people response, okay, so when we talk about a municipality, and there's the resource type, and you all buy fire engines, engines are pumpers, they pump water out of fire hydrants, or if you live in a rural area, out of a pond or a creek or something like that. They carry water on it, okay? And then you have a ladder truck, and a ladder truck does certain types of duties, you know, search and rescue and things like that. And if you look at this example, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different municipalities that respond on a reported house fire, 
okay? Each one of those vehicles, okay, have, has a responsibility, okay? And you'll see the amount of water that they could pump and they're carrying water and stuff like that. Now, what is important in the variable that we do not know in most situations in Pennsylvania, unless you have a paid fire department, is that number of firefighters. Why is this important? Why do you think this is important? So there are a variety of fire ground tasks that need to be accomplished. So based on my, my knowledge of current operations in this, in, this, uh, in this scheme right here that I'm showing you in this chart, uh, in an afternoon or, or an evening fire call, okay, these fire companies could provide that type of staffing. Okay. Now, again, when you are an all volunteer company, you know, on the weekend or you can't guarantee what that number is going to be. So if you look at engine 230, a staffing of three volunteers. Now we're assuming that those volunteers are trained. Okay. That they have trained. Why is this important? And why do you need to understand this for your township? Okay. You need to see what, what is called the reliability of each one of those organizations, okay? So what we are seeing in some parts of Pennsylvania, we are seeing instead of six fire companies being dispatched on a structure fire, we are seeing eight to 10 fire companies, and this is one large county in Western Pennsylvania that I see on a regular basis, because their volunteer staffing is they're responding with one, or they're responding with two or they're responding with no trained personnel, okay? So why do we need 24 firefighters on the scene? And it's directly related to this chart right here, or close to it, okay? Why do firefighters think, why, why are people, we always talking about stat, why do we need people, okay? There are certain things that need to occur in sequence as you arrive on the scene. Uh, the fire chief needs to be in command. There's people that need to pull a hose line to the second or third floor, and there's three people. Somebody needs to operate the fire pump. There's a backup. There's attaching the hose to the hydrants. There's a standby crew. Uh, there's search and rescue for victims. Uh, there's other overhead officers, a safety officer, a command officer, division and group supervisor. So... This is being accomplished very well in, in different areas of Pennsylvania, okay, being very, very well, but, but, but where, where it comes down to is where we start to wobble a little bit is in an all-volunteer system, you don't know what these numbers are. And, how, and, and where you talk about when, when somebody uses the statement, we need to recruit volunteers, well, we need to recruit a certain type of volunteer, or we need to recruit, uh, you know, for example, you know, you, how many new interior firefighters do you need in your organization every year to ensure that we have six people, okay? I don't expect in my fire department 20 people in one department to come out on a call. It's just not realistic in today's environment. But if I can get six people or eight people that are trained and ready to go, that's a victory, okay? That's a victory. So understanding your staffing, go ahead. So, uh, can you go back to that slide? Um, the other one with Hampton Township. So really in this model, and, you, and you're right, um, we're really delivering the service on a regional basis, but we're funding it on a local basis because that, that truck 30, that's $1.2 million with three people on it. Um, that that's rolling down the road. Um, and then you have another one that costs $600,000 and that's rolling down the road. Um, but Hampton Township is is helping to fund East Pinsboro situation. Silver Spring Township is helping to fund, you know, and, and if, if Silver Spring volunteer gets hurt, um, you know, the when he gets hurt or she gets hurt in Hampton Township. Um, so we're really, and, um, you know, I just, it, th that really just jumped out at me that everybody's working together. Um, but, you know, each of those individual municipalities are footing their own bill. But I would venture to say that 50, 60 percent of their calls aren't within their township or borough because they're supporting and, one another. And that's the that's the automatic aid system that we have in Pennsylvania. Very good point. Very good point. Ray, you just raised your hand there. 
Yeah, if you think if you think that with fire, you should see EMS. It's worse. Yeah, we'll do a whole webinar on EMS, and I'm going to delegate that to somebody else. Sorry, yeah, it's it's worse. Believe me. Uh, we're we're coming to our end here, people. So thank you very much for for uh, this. So I want to talk again, and and Jared, are you uh, are you able to talk about this slide for me? Yep. Um, so. Just to really quick go back to the previous slides uh, that Jerry was talking about that listed, you know, uh, the next one up, Jerry, the Hamden Township one. Um, so I, I've been in the fire service about 25 years and, you know, in my in my daily role, besides, you know, all my administrative operational stuff, you know, I still respond to calls most of the time as an incident commander. Um, so when I when I look at the slide that there's three words or two words up top that I love where it says automatic aid. Um, that is so important for fire departments to already have predetermined assignments more so than just the fire chief throwing a dart at the wall saying, who am I going to call for this fire? Um, you know, as he lists all the trucks and from the different municipalities and like, um, you know, John said it is on a regional approach. And, you know, I look at it for my department, you know, we go automatic aid to a neighboring municipality probably more than they come to us, but they're bringing two tankers for our non-hydrogen areas most of the time. So there's definitely that give and take. Um, you know, I hear about it, you know, throughout the state when they talk about, you know, automatic aid assisting, we go more places than they come to us, but it's just the nature of the beast in the fire service. And, you know, we may respond somewhere 20 times, they may come to us once, but that one time it was very vital to, to have them. And that's any department's going to have those types of those numbers. So yeah, Jerry, if you want to jump down to the 1720. Um, all right, so uh, so NFPA, um, National Fire Protection Association, of course, has, you know, numerous, uh, you know, recommendations, standards that cover anything and everything regarding the fire service, anything from, you know, fire truck manufacturing, air packs, gear, helmets, you name it, they have it. So they have two standards, which are really important for elected officials to understand. NFPA 1710 and then NFPA 1720. So 1710 revolves more around the career fire side. You know, 1720 is for the, you know, the volunteer, more of your accommodation department. Um, now, granted, it is a standard. It's more of a recommendation. You don't really have, like, you know, you don't have to abide by everything by NFPA, but it's something important to work towards. This also will help out with your ISO grading because this is what they look at. So if you start at the top, you just look going across our uh, urban area. So greater than 1000 people per square mile, they want you to have 15 people on scene within nine minutes, 90% of the time for house fires, for building fires. Um, and that's where whenever you go back up to the previous slide with all the different apparatus, you know, it's important to kind of beef up those run cards or box cards to make sure you're meeting the people, not, not so much the apparatus, because really most residential fires, you can take care of it with two engines and one ladder truck, but it's the people. And you have to, when you develop those cards, those run cards and those box cards, you have to actually sit there and say, okay, when is our lowest staffing? When are we doing things the lowest? And that's how you have to kind of, to make them. So as it drops down into the suburban, rural, remote, special risk, you know, suburban 500 to a thousand people, of course, your staffing drops, your response time goes up and you're you know, meeting the objective percentage drops down a little bit. As you see rural area, of course, the staffing goes down, the response times goes up because you're gonna have further to travel. You know, in the suburban rural areas, you're gonna have you know, longer response times than you would within an urban area. Um, well, Catherine Carter just asked, AHJ is authority having jurisdiction. So that would be you know, your municipality, your fire department. Uh, the special risk determined by the AHJ well, that kind of goes back to your standard of cover. And, you know, that's where, you know, special risk is when you're getting very, you know, long travel distance from fire stations, um, from water supplies, where I worked in California within my county, uh, we had a 203 square mile first due response area in one fire station. So, you know, we, we had our, uh, you know, standard of cover, which, you know, we had worked with our automatic aid to come up with what we wanted our minimum staffing to be, what the response times were, and how often we meet the objective. Going back to emergency reporting, they actually do have a section within emergency reporting. We talked about sharing information with other departments, because that's where you're going to get your staffing numbers and response times. 
but you can actually run those 1710 and 1720 reports within emergency reporting to show if you're actually meeting that based on your municipality's population on what your demand zone is. Very good, thank you. You know, you could have different, different standards of cover. And what we mean by that is two, there's two components of that. Uh, a, a, a response time when you get that apparatus on the scene component. And the other component is the people that arrive on scene over a period of time. Okay, that's what that means. And you could have different response times for each box or, or different standards to measure uh, for these type of incidents. Because, you know, a structure fire, you know, that's, that, that requires a lot of people, okay, uh, versus some other type of incidents that do occur. Now, here's an example. Here is an example of a standard of color, okay, a statement of of a performance that we will measure, okay, a performance that we would measure. And this is just an example, okay, uh, based on, uh, based on um, you know, a theoretical uh, structure fire where you have a, a, a house fire, that a standard that the first engine is expected to arrive on scene in eight minutes or less from dispatch, okay? The first engine is expected to arrive in eight minutes or less from dispatch on scene 90% of the time. Okay. Uh, if you're in it, you, you know, again, that, that is just a statement after reviewing your data, after reviewing your expectations, okay, after talking to your citizens on what you think that might be, okay, um, that is an example of a performance standard first in unit, because you don't expect all of those units to arrive within five to eight minutes because of their station locations, or they come from home volunteers, um, the travel time from this borough to this township, okay? That complement of fire apparatus, that first alarm assignment, they will arrive over a period of time, okay? And those fire ground tasks, those fire ground tasks will, you know, again, that first engine, that first chief, you know, they're going to assess the situation. They're going to uh, walk around the building. They're going to establish command. And that first in engine that arrives is going to hook up to a hydrant and, and pull a line into the building and, and initiate firefighting operations if they have enough people. Okay. There's fire engines arriving in Pennsylvania with one person on, okay? And, and they can't really do much until there's more people. So this is one part of a, a performance standard that we're gonna measure the standard quarter, okay? We're gonna measure the standard quarter, or we might measure it every year. And why am I saying we're gonna measure a standard, okay? Because how do you know that you need to do something different, okay? You have to measure a standard. And if you're not meeting that standard uh, for, for, for an incident, that's when you need to do something different. Uh, you know, the balance of the alarm right here, okay? The balance of the alarm. Uh, the complement of the initial uh, response vehicles on a working firebox is expected to arrive in less than 13 minutes from dispatch 90% of the time. And we have to ask ourselves, okay, is it reasonable in 2022 in uh, suburban Pennsylvania with high risk environments to get your fire department on the scene, your, your resources on the scene, that first unit within a period of time, and then um, the complement of the apparatus within 13 minutes, okay? Is that reasonable? We know by science, we know by technology, and we know that the sooner the firefighters get there, the greater the chance of saving victims are and the greater it is of reducing risk and putting the incident out. So John, you had a comment to make on that. Yeah, so as, so as township officials, when we're looking at, at, at going to the community and saying, we have to borrow $3 million to build a new station or whatever it is, um, why do we need it? Well, the data will show that you know, right now, uh, once you have these performance standards, but also once you have the facts, that right now it's taking us 12 minutes to get on scene. Whereas by doing this, we're, we want a performance standard to make that seven minutes. 
And I think th th that helps give political cover, if you will, why you're making those tough financial decisions to say, here's what it is now. Um, or maybe it's deteriorating. Maybe it was 12 minutes and now it's 17 minutes or whatever it would be. Um, and I think that that, that data uh, needs to be uh, quantified and then and then you know given back to the community to help justify what we as elected officials feel that we need to do um, in order to deliver the service. All right. And then there's a staffing model too with that, right? I want to continue to move on. And again, the reason why we do this, okay, and we'll, we're almost almost completed, almost done, and then we'll open it up for any questions, is why do we, the measurement of data and trigger points, okay, the measurement of data and trigger points. So a lot of people in Pennsylvania, you know, you have to answer that question of, okay, we need to do our volunteer recruitment campaign. We need to train our firefighters that we recruit. And that's usually a one to two year process. And then they got to be mentored. You know, it takes three to four to five years to, to be able to get somebody from zero to, you know, being kind of comfortable on the interior of a fire. Um, but, you know, some people say, well, we don't have enough, we have to hire paid, we have to hire drivers, we have to hire, we have to do this immediately, okay? Well, uh, you know, when you have a standard and you're monitoring that standard, you may determine that if, you know, for a, a period of six months, you know, we're having some real struggles in response times, okay? And, you know, we as a policy decision, you know, we may need to adjust operations based on, you know, we're down to hardly any volunteers. Uh, we, we track it by time of day, day of week, month of year. You know, is it a weekend? Is it, okay, we need to do something different. Okay, we measure that data and there's a trigger point to do something different, okay? And maybe that trigger point is, you know, we're down, we're, we're responding with less than three trained members on a regular basis or whatever that may be. Um, and then you, you know, then you have to look at, you know, are we gonna, are we gonna do something different? So here's the, the model for something different is how do we adjust, how do we adjust what we do? Okay, how do we adjust what we do? Uh, and, you know, adjusted, Fire operations, again, is you have an all volunteer system. If you're not meeting the standards, okay, you got a chance, you got, you got a choice. You either recruit more volunteers and you keep doing that. The next model that we've seen in Pennsylvania is the stipend volunteer, okay? And there's some, there's some systems in suburban uh, Philadelphia area that are stipend volunteers right now that many of you guys probably know out more than me. There's some stipend uh, programs that are out in Western Pennsylvania that I know of. Some people have moved to the part-time driver system to support volunteers, okay? In the Carlisle suburban area, uh, east, west of where I am right now, they have part-time drivers, okay? Um, they, then the next move went the part-time system doesn't seem to work. Uh, they have the full-time support of volunteers, okay? And, and what I consider probably what Jared's system is, is he has full-time support to the volunteers because full-time covers during times of day, days of week. And when those volunteers go home or those fire career staff goes home, um, you know, the volunteers take over and they're responsible. And then you have a system where there's full-time and part-time with volunteer support. Okay. Full-time and part-time with volunteer support. And then there's places where they transition where it's mostly all full-time and part-time with no volunteers. Okay. And there's systems like that in Pennsylvania right now that are, are like that. So adjusted fire operations, again, is, is something that, uh, you know, a term that I have, uh, I have used. And again, that's also always a, a, a decision that you have to make. And there's different programs. There's different programs in place. It is not as easy as you think just to implement one of these things. You have to do it in a strategic way and in a strategic environment with the proper leadership to support those type of things. So as I finish this and open it up for, for further discussions is, uh, you know, I never really like, and I don't believe in the uh, going in and, and meeting with elected officials and saying, if you don't do this, uh, babies are gonna die. Or, or if, you know, you, that it never works. It never works. And when I work with fire officers and I work with, uh, with members of, uh, uh, leadership programs for fire officers. I always talk about building that effective relationship by never threatening, never, never saying, 
if you don't, and, and unfortunately it still happens in, in areas of Pennsylvania, but this was a, a significant incident that occurred in Western Pennsylvania about three years ago. This is a combination fire department where the career staff of two people, they have two career firefighters, uh, Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., okay. Uh, the cover uh, went uh, uh, and um, after 11 p.m., it goes back to the volunteers. Uh, and on weekends and holidays, uh, it's an all volunteer organization. So this structure was, uh, this structure occurred. Uh, that is a high rise senior citizen living facility. And um, uh, there was a fire there, and it happened at 1145 at night, 1145 at night, 45 minutes after the career staff went home at night. And uh, according to the media reports and confirmed by the fire chief, uh, the township uh, fire engine arrived on the scene eight, 18 minutes after, uh, after uh, the fire started. Now the automatic aid engine, okay, the automatic aid engine came from a, a city in Western Pennsylvania and that city had a staffing of five people, okay? And when they go on automatic aid, only two members of that fire company are permitted to go on automatic aid. So two members showed up. Uh, it took 34 minutes to get water on that fire. It took 34 minutes and there was a fatality. There was a fatality that occurred. And again, there, this was again, all over the media. I will give the fire chief uh, credit. Uh, he, he, has, he has since retired. Uh, that he did admit that it was not acceptable. And, and uh, you know, the question that I always ask elected officials and, and township officials is, you know, can, can you stand up when, the, when there is an incident uh, and, and talk to the media uh, and, and explain your system, okay? And, and what I always like to say is that if you know there are gaps in the system, okay? If you know there are gaps in your system, um, what are you doing to fill those gaps? And what are you doing uh, to do something next? What is there a strategic plan in the organization to move to ensure that we have a response time and, and make sure that people show up? So with that in mind, we're just about completed. Um, I wanna open it up for questions in our final 10 minutes of the program. Uh, the next webinar, will we'll be on Thursday, September 8th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, we will do uh, one, out, uh, one section will be recruitment and retention best practices. Uh, we will do a transition from all volunteer to combination. And we'll talk about some of the regionalization efforts in Pennsylvania. Uh, the other event that we are planning is, uh, it is going to be a panel discussion on the future of the fire service in, in Pennsylvania. And it will include uh, some of the discussions and feedback that we've had in these sessions uh, at the Municipal Leadership Summit uh, that is sponsored by the Pennsylvania Municipal League and the Pennsylvania Association of Township Commissioners on Friday, October 7th at 2.45 to 3.45 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So with that in mind, I will be, uh, I do have all of your emails. I, I will be sending a, uh, a, uh, this, this uh, PowerPoint to all of you, uh, if you have, I, I do have received your suggestions that you've had, and I, I probably, if I, if I will, uh, if I have time, I could do an evaluation, but maybe, maybe somebody else has, we, we can get an evaluation out of that. So uh, I'll open it for any specific questions that anybody would have for our thing. And I'm happy to report that 46 out of the 51 people lasted until uh, lasted until the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Jerry, there was a question in the chat. Okay, you, go um, ahead. you want to address it there. Yeah, so is there any recommended number of trained volunteers a town should have based on the population considering current volunteer response rates? You want to try that one? I, you know, the, I've, I've heard this question before. I've, I think I've been probably involved in a couple conversations similar, but, you know, there's a lot of different schools of thought when it comes to the number of people. And typically what, what 
municipalities will do is they'll compare themselves to say the ratio of a career firefighter in a city, you know, how the, the, basically the ratio of career firefighters to population, some like, you know, your, your larger cities, and they'll try to say, okay, well, if, you know, you have a hundred firefighters per hundred thousand people, and then your municipality has, you know, 10,000 people, you know, how many should you have 10 firefighters? Um, I don't really think there's any exact number unless you know of something. The thing that I would recommend, again, it comes back to that concept of standard of cover that we want on our fire truck to have three people, three trained members or six trained members, three on an engine, three on a ladder to be able to be available to respond uh, on a regular bit on 24 seven, seven days a week. OK, now the, the challenge that we have in the volunteer service is our model right now is I'll hold this up is. You know, this pager goes off. We're hoping, you know, I can get a call in 10 minutes and have 20 people show up. Okay. You know, in reality, if it's a minor call, we only need four to five to six people on a, on a normal call. Okay. On a house fire, we might need more. Okay. It's more of using, and that's where some departments in different states have moved to a what's called a scheduling of a volunteer system or a duty crew system, where I know State College does this, is one of the big ones in Pennsylvania. They have the call volume to justify it, where they are scheduling their volunteers, and that kind of identifies the number that they need, okay? The, the concept of we just need more, you know, that's challenge because, you know, when you ask for more, there's different cl classifications. You know, in reality, we need firefighters with strong backs and the ability to lift people, pull people, move people, and do that kind of thing. Yes, we need the fire police. Very important function. Uh, we have, a, you know, uh, uh, we have a we have a very good fire police program, but there's areas of Pennsylvania that, I, that don't even use them, and I think they're very valuable if they're managed. The administrative aspects are very important, but but again, it's coming down to what what is that uh, what is that. OK, what 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 is your state? What do you expect? You know, uh, and, and, and what I can tell you that is very unrealistic, that if you have a station with with eight vehicles in it, with uh, five to six seats in every vehicle. OK, it is very unrealistic in today's environment in Pennsylvania to think that every one of those seats are going to get filled. OK, uh, and it, it's we just don't have enough people anymore to do that. So. Hopefully that didn't. Other questions that anybody may have. All right, uh, John, you have any uh, closing comments? Sure, Th thanks everybody for your time and your leadership in your communities. Um, what, what I'd like to do is really to challenge everybody. Um, you know, what do you wanna get out of this? Um, you know, please let Jerry and I know that you know, for the next session and going forward, you know, this issue is not gonna be resolved in October at the summit. Um, so, you know, where do we go post October, you know, and, and what, how can PSATC and, and certainly Jerry's organization, the Institute, how can we help you do what you need to do? Um, so please, you know, send me an email, shoot Jerry an email. Um, you know, here's what I'd like to see. Maybe you can help us on this. Um, we we want to be engaged and active on this because it's a, no pun intended, it's a burning issue in our, well, maybe it is pun, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and we're together that we can go and help one another out. So, so um, um, please provide any thoughts on where you'd like us to help you. And thank you for your leadership and time. All right. Very good. Thank you, everybody.